Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Ollaby, a history teacher here at Campbell Village College and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's talk, the latest in our series of educational lectures this term. I'm also joined by my wonderful colleague Jess Angel, who will be taking care of all things technological. There's a few more lectures for the rest of this half term and as always anyone is welcome to attend. Now if you have any questions during today's talk, please do submit them via the chat box so I can ask them at the end. Before we start though, it's worth explaining what these lectures are actually for. For those of you joining us from further afield, our school in Camborne is a village college. Now, village colleges were founded in the 1930s by Cambridgeshire's then Education Minister Henry Morris, and his aim was to provide a place of education for the whole community, irrespective of their age or occupation. And we hope that these lectures can help sustain Morris's idea that education is a public good that should be shared with everyone. It's been fantastic to see so many students, teachers and members of the public coming along, listening and learning and asking questions. Now these talks are only possible because of the incredible generosity of the historians and scientists and other academics who have given up their time to share their expertise with us. And today we are very lucky to be joined by Professor Sir Harry Badisha, the Tata Steele Professor of Metallurgy at the University of Cambridge, whose long and distinguished career has made many breakthroughs in science that I don't fully understand. But his talk today will be exploring, exploring a fascinating story about the Cuffley airship. Now there's a little mystery around this, so I look forward to finding out what it is. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Sir Harry Badisha. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jacob and uh, Jessica, for giving me this opportunity to present a talk. And, you know, I'm hoping that because I'm not a historian, the audience uh, of students at the end will explain to me if I've gone wrong in the historical part of the investigation. So I'm looking forward to the discussion towards the end and uh, I'll explain uh, how this came about. So uh, the title is The Metal Fragment and the Cuffley Airship. So first of all, I'll uh, just highlight where Cuffley is and this is uh, taken from Google Maps and here we have the English Channel, London and Cuffley is located not far from London, actually some uh, something like 35 miles from London and its population in 1860 was just 90 people. So it was classified as a hamlet rather than a, a village, for example, or, or a town. And then uh, an event happened in 1910, which involved a railway station being built in Cuffley, making it uh, more accessible. And the population rose to something like 800 people. And right now it is of the order of 4,000 uh, people. So it's not a very big place even now. So Cambridge, for example, is of the order of 170,000 people. And that's regarded as a small, small town. So Cuffley is close to London, and that's uh, an important aspect of this story, and close to the English Channel. In other words, also not too distant from the continental part of Europe. Now, the second event that made Cuffley really quite famous uh, happened in 1916. And I'll explain what that event was, but this was, of course, uh, the period where, uh, you know, there was a World War One. So the sort of um, air power in those days included uh, aircraft, but also included airships. That means huge uh, objects which fly at a height of about 16,000 feet and uh, drop bombs. And this is the area that the airships which came from Germany would be bombing. So mostly north of the River Thames and Cuffley is close enough to the bombing area because bear in mind that uh, the airships were not particularly accurate uh, in, in their bombing and also their exact trajectories depended on you know, the weather the wind and, and so forth and so on. So they're not the most easy objects to actually control. So this is roughly the area 
where an awful lot of uh, bombs were dropped from the airships onto England. So the airship raids killed about 500 people in all during, during World War I and injured something of the order of uh, 2,000 people. Um, now, just to put this into perspective, um, the war in Iraq, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, caused approximately 700,000 deaths, and that's 2.5% of the population of Iraq. So the main achievement of the airship raids was not actually to cause Lot, uh, not not to cause huge loss of life, but to terrorize. Okay, terrorize uh, the English language meaning of terrorize that means make people frightened because you had these objects coming from the air, uh, from the sky, and uh, you know, dropping bombs, uh, kind of uh, indiscriminately. So they often had the nickname baby killers because uh, the bombs would cause uh, mostly civilian population uh, injuries and death. Now the airships, there were two kinds of airships that uh, Germany manufactured uh, around this period uh, of um, 1916 and uh, somewhat before that. And this is one of those airships uh, manufactured by the company Scheuter Lanz. And this is the particular airship SL-11 that was shot down over Kafli. Okay, and that's why Kafli became famous because this is the first ever airship that could be actually shot down. You know, the airships flew at a high altitude, so ground fire usually wouldn't uh, get them with any accuracy. And then the raids were usually at night, so you had to actually find them in the sky before you could aim at them. Now, the airships were huge objects, okay, about 174 meters in length, 20 meters in diameter, and they floated, obviously, because they contained hydrogen, something like 40,000 cubic meters of hydrogen. And in a later slide, I'll show you the structure inside the airship. Um, and they could carry a payload, that means uh, bombs, of about 21,000 kilograms. Now, this particular airship is actually one of the smaller airships. The other variety of airships, which I'll come to later, uh, were even bigger uh, than this. But this is the particular airship which made uh, Kafli very famous because it was the first one to be shot down over England. Now, you might think that it's very easy to shoot down something containing hydrogen. And bear in mind that, uh, you know, this is not like uh, a balloon in, in the sense that uh, the pressure difference between the hydrogen inside the airship and the atmosphere is quite small. All you need is this large volume so that the density of carrying the bombs and the engine and so forth are accounted for in getting a lift. Uh, a vertical lift. So you might think that it's very easy to blow up something containing hydrogen by firing bullets in them, first to puncture it and second to set it on fire. Uh, now the puncturing doesn't have much of an effect because you see later that not only is the pressure difference between the hydrogen and the atmosphere small, but, which means that the leak rate becomes small if you just have a bullet hole, but also there are compartments inside the airship. So you'd have to uh, destroy a number of them for the hydrogen to basically not give sufficient lift. But why didn't they burn when they were shot at by incendiary bullets? Okay, incendiary bullets means the bullet is actually burning while it, while it is uh, progressing in its uh, trajectory. Well, in order to get a fire, you need to have a fuel, you need to have oxygen and a spark. And the fuel is there in the form of hydrogen and the spark is there in the form of uh, incendiary bullets. 
uh, either fired from the ground or from uh, the aircraft of the uh, Royal um, Aircraft Corps. But when the bullet goes through, the mass of the hydrogen inside the airship doesn't have any access to oxygen. So it isn't possible to shoot that down, shoot them down simply by firing bullets at them. You have to have a combination of the incendiary bullets, the bullets which are burning, and explosive bullets which cause a hole large enough to give the hydrogen access to oxygen in the atmosphere. And this is uh, Lieutenant uh, William Leaf Robinson, who, uh, who shot the first airship down. Okay? And there was a, a raid by these airships uh, over, over London, and it was nighttime. And he took off from the airfield and he was searching for these airships. And he came across one of them. And his, uh, his uh, guns were loaded with a combination of incendiary bullets and explosive bullets. So after firing lots and lots of shots, uh, he managed to get the hydrogen to ignite. And the airship came down in a huge burning mass over Cuffley. And this was such a huge boost to morale in England, uh, in Britain, that just two days later, he was awarded the Victoria Cross and he became uh, a kind of a hero uh, overnight. He actually went to sleep after landing and, uh, you know, returning from his uh, mission. But when he woke up, you know, he was like a national hero because the first one of these baby killers in inverted commas had been downed. And after that, you know, the use of airships continued but declined fairly rapidly um, in a fairly short period. So, Lieutenant William Leaf Robinson was immediately uh, promoted to captain and uh, was awarded the Victoria Cross, which is the highest uh, award, highest of the royal awards that can be given to anybody. And this is uh, uh, this is a uh, the site showing the debris from these massive airships. So obviously uh, a lot of uh, the frame has been burnt because these particular airships had a wooden frame. Uh, but uh, there were steel wires and the engine was made of metal and so on, and all that debris uh, survived. So these are people from the Royal Flying Corps who were collecting the debris for study and examination and so forth. Um, and here is the engine of the airship itself, and it was being loaded uh, to take away for examination. Now, there were lots and lots of small pieces left over, which uh, people flocked to Cuffley, you know, because there was a train station there now, and lots of people basically traveled to Cuffley to acquire uh, either a souvenir uh, or to make things out of it and sell them, like bangles and so forth, so that uh, you could raise money for the uh, Red Cross. So a lot of pieces of metal were taken away from the site uh, as souvenirs or as uh, items to make jewelry from. So the wooden frame was completely burnt out. You know, the rigid wooden frame which makes the body of the airship and inside you have these uh, big balloons which hold the hydrogen. But the reinforcing wire and metal from the gondolas and engines was recovered. Now, how, how did I come across uh, this story about the Cuffley airship and what's the connection that I have with this? Well, this picture here shows Darwin College, which is uh, my college in uh, Cambridge, and it's a postgraduate college only. Uh, so everyone here is doing some sort of research and we also, apart from students, some something like 600 uh, students doing PhDs 
and so on. Uh, there are more senior people, uh, for example, research fellows, uh, young people who are, you know, really making a contribution to knowledge in many different ways. And all of these people are not limited to one subject, as you would be in a department in the university. They cover every subject, history, philosophy, uh, economics, science, uh, language, computations, and, and so on. So any subject you care to mention, we can find in college. So it really is a fantastic environment where you meet people from all kinds of different subjects and you learn about what they're doing. Uh, so, for example, on Tuesday before the pandemic, on Tuesdays at lunchtime, while we are eating, somebody who, from the humanities would give a talk, a 20 minute talk, and then we would have a, a nice discussion. And on Thursdays, we would have uh, someone from the sciences and mathematics give a similar talk at lunchtime. And Darwin College also organizes a series of public lectures in January, uh, which are completely interdisciplinary. So there will be four from humanities and four from sciences, and the whole thing is constitutes the largest set of public lectures, the most popular public lectures in the whole of Cambridge. And a book is published after that. Uh, so last year, for example, the topic was blood and we had four humanities lectures on blood and four uh, sciences lectures on blood. Now, I mentioned to you that there is a mix of people apart from the student body, which is the largest. We also have more senior people. And I met uh, someone called Michael Cook, an elderly gentleman at lunch, you know, just a, a sort of a random meeting at lunch. And he had been carrying in his wallet a piece of metal, which is illustrated here, uh, in the hope of uh, coming across me at lunch. OK, uh, and uh, this piece of metal is uh, quite light and it's about three centimeters in length. And it has a corrugated form. And Michael is actually an infrequent visitor uh, to Darwin College when before the pandemic. But I used to go there more or less every day uh, and participate sometimes in talking about football, sometimes talking about science and sometimes about humanities. But he had been carrying this uh, object in his uh, jacket pocket, in his wallet, uh, until we finally met by chance and introduced ourselves as, as you do. So the fragment was acquired originally by Michael's mother's uncle, apparently the first shooting down of an airship or a cufflink. So uh, the history of his family says that this piece came from the Cuffley airship. And here is the actual uh, note that he gave me, that uh, it's an aluminum based fragment from the German airship that crashed near Cuffley in 1916. And it was shot down by Lieutenant Leif uh, Robertson, who was uh, awarded the Victoria Cross and promoted to captain in the um, RFC, the Royal Flying Corps. And he says the fragment was collected by Jeffrey Googe, uh, my mother's uncle, who probably cycled from Hampstead. So Cuffley is near Hampstead. Uh, and a large number of people visited the site. As I explained to you, there was a railway station, so there were crowds and crowds of people going to see this first airship that had been downed. Uh, and there are larger pieces on show at the Imperial War Museum in London and Michael Cook. So uh, he came to me with this piece and said, look, uh, you can have it. Okay. And I said, I'd like to do some investigations on this piece. But first of all, you know, this is a corrugated piece of metal. And the reason why it's corrugated is exactly like corrugated roofs uh, on, um, you know, sheds and so forth. It gives it uh, structural rigidity if you put in this corrugation. So if I put a load from the top, then the deflection I expect, it varies, uh, varies with the inverse of uh, the depth of the corrugation. So that's that's the depth and the thickness of the sheet. Now, you don't really want to increase the thickness of the sheet because 
uh, obviously that adds weight and we are talking about an airship, so you want to make the structure light. But putting in these corrugations has a massive effect because it, the stiffness then increases with one upon the depth of the corrugations. The, the deflection that happens when you put a load uh, increases with one upon d squared. So by putting corrugations, this you put in some engineered stiffness into the object and therefore you can use less material to make the framework of an airship. And this particular piece of metal uh, is known as uh, duralumin, okay? And this was invented in Germany. So it's mostly aluminium, but it contains small quantities of copper, magnesium and manganese. And I'll talk about uh, that part later. And it was invented and patented by Alfred Will, who was, uh, Wilm, who was a Berlin chemist in, in 1906. And the astonishing thing about this was that, uh, you know, when he tested or when his, he and his staff tested the hardness after a few days, the hardness had increased. The strength of the material had increased at room temperature. And the material was first produced in Duran, and that's the reason why it's called Duralumin, okay? And it's pronounced Duralumin. And what they did was they heated it up to 500 degrees centigrade. And remember, the melting temperature of alu pure aluminium is about 655 degrees centigrade. So it took it up to 500, quenched it, that means cooled it rapidly, and just by chance, they left it, uh, they measured the hardness, left it and came back to complete the test and found that it had hardened at room temperature over a period of days. So something goes on inside which causes it to harden. So I just want to explain the meaning now of a solution. So imagine that this is, uh, uh, you're preparing a cup of tea and you put in sugar lumps, okay? Uh, this looks like a lot of sugar lumps, but let's assume that when we heat up to 95 degrees centigrade, they all dissolve. So that's what we call solution when the sugar molecules and the water molecules are mixed up. Okay, and we can't see either the sugar or uh, the pure water anymore. It's a complete mixture. And the reason why that happens, part of the reason why that happens is that when you raise temperature, temperature favors disorder. Yeah. So this is kind of ordered in the sense that we have sugar and we have water, but as you raise the temperature, uh, the, the nature likes disorder and therefore at high temperatures, everything gets mixed up. So when you cool this again, the sugar will start to come out again, okay? because we've added quite a lot of sugar here and you take it into solution, we had to heat it up to 95 degrees centigrade. When I cool it again, the sugar again comes out of solution. And the form of the particles will be different from the original form, depending on how rapidly you have cooled from 95 degrees to 35 degrees centigrade. So you can control the size of these particles by the heat treatment that you give the material. Now, this story is about liquid and sugar, but exactly the same principle applies to a metal which contains uh, another element. So aluminium and copper, a small amount of copper in aluminium at a high temperature will dissolve. So, so we call that a solid solution. So the copper atoms and the aluminium atoms mix together and we can't distinguish either the copper or the aluminium. So that's a situation like this at high temperatures. And when you cool it, the copper wants to come out of solution again. And that is the thing that gives the hardening effect that uh, Wilm observed. Now, we took the aluminium fragment and we wanted to look at the structure at a very high magnification. So this is a, an instrument called a scanning electron microscope. Uh, and with that, basically, you shine electron beams onto your sample and you get various kinds of emissions from the sample. First of all, some of the electrons lose energy and come out as low energy electrons. And using those, 
uh, with the lenses in the system, we can look at the structure of the material. But at the same time, there are X-rays emitted depending on the chemical composition of the material. So, you know, if we have copper, we would get uh, characteristic X-rays associated with electronic transitions in copper. And if we had aluminium, then we would get a different wavelength of X-rays. So by looking at these X-rays, we can actually determine the composition of the metal. But the really nice thing is that the region that we examine can be very, very small. So we are not dissolving our whole component and then doing some chemistry to find out what it contains, but we do a non-destructive examination of this uh, piece of metal where the electron beam gives us information both on the structure and the chemical composition underneath. So I got uh, one of my uh, PhD students uh, I, uh, to help me to do this because it's a long time since I've done experimental work myself. So this is Aparo Chinta. He has completed his PhD and now he's working at the Tata Steel Laboratories in India. But he took uh, all the information that I'm going to show you from that scanning electron microscope. So this is the actual piece, uh, the metal fragment. And you can see that there is some structure here. So these is what we call, this is what we call a grain. That means a single crystal of aluminium. And here's another single crystal in a different sort of orientation and another one and so on. So these are individual crystals and the cluster, we call it a polycrystal. But notice that apart from the crystals of uh, mostly aluminium, we also have these things here. And these are the precipitates, the particles which came out after cooling from 500 degrees centigrade uh, to room temperature. So these are the copper rich particles which precipitated just like the sugar particles precipitated on going from 95 to 35 degrees centigrade and give us the hardening. Now, this particular structure, remember this is from a long time ago, okay, 1916-ish. And we still use duralumin, but it would have a much finer state of copper. I'll show you later on. But bear in mind that this is technology going back to 1916 and the mechanisms by which uh, you create these structures were not really fully understood at the time. Neither did they ha have all the instruments that we have now. This uh, is the spectrum that we get of the chemical composition from these regions. And notice that there is copper and silver. Right? And this is a deliberate addition of silver and magnesium and copper to this alloy to get the full range of properties that they wanted. Uh, so the hardening effect that I mentioned earlier becomes uh, better if we have also a silver addition to the material. So the, this is only a few percent, uh, something of the order of two to three weight percent of silver, but it's considered as an uh, as a useful element to add even in modern alloys. So um, my first impression was that this dur duralumin came from the SL-11 um, airship, which was shot down over Cuffley. But it turns out that there were two manufacturers, right? One uh, I've already mentioned, SL, Scheuter Lanz, and they, according to much of the information I had at the time had wooden uh, uh, rigid framework and metal components, but the metal components were iron based, okay, and several gas bags within. But there was also the Zeppelin airship. Uh, so these were mostly used by the German army and these by the German navy. And they deliberately went for a duralumin rigid metal framework, uh, again with several gas bags within. So this, this kind of uh, elementary information that I had cast doubt on whether the metal fragment actually came from the SL-11 airship or the Zeppelins which were shot down not far from uh, Cuffley uh, later. So it required further investigation. And 
I contacted the Kofli uh, City Council uh, and North uh, Council uh, and the Council of Peter Dates. He told me that duramin was used exclusively in Zeppelin airships, not in the uh, SL airships. And he in turn contacted the author, Raymond Rimmel, of uh, a, a very famous book called The Airship VC, that means the airship, uh, you know, the pilot, um, Leaf, who got the Victoria Cross. So he's written a book about this, and actually he's uh, quite a famous author anyway, because he's written about many of these uh, uh, aircraft. And he told me uh, via, via Councillor Peter Days that this is a fragment from a typical Zeppelin framework, and if local, it can only have come from the L13. L, L13 is uh, Zeppelin terminology. So I then had a long conversation with Michael Cook, uh, who was adamant that the piece is from SL11 based on many family conversations over a long period of time. Okay. So I needed to do some more work. So I went uh, to the, uh, I contacted the Imperial War Museum and uh, Martin Anthony, who is the assistant uh, curator for First World War uh, artifacts, uh, was kind enough to send me a very long uh, message, which uh, I've uh, abbreviated here. Uh, he said that the SL-11 was a wooden construction, and of course, the very little of the wood was left after it caught fire, but a great deal of wire. And the early press reports suggest that rings and bangles were being made from the wire, sold to raise money for the Red Cross. And Kafli became a very popular place to visit. So to satisfy visitors and to raise more money, I gather that the wreckage of other wire ships was also displayed at the Kafli uh, site when they were shot down in the following weeks or months, uh, possibly the L31 and L32. And the souvenirs from these other airships were also sold there. So if Michael Cook's uh, mother's uncle visited the Kofli site more than three weeks after the crash of SL-11, it's very possible that he saw uh, wreckage from a different airship that was made from Duralamin. So for a long time, there was some confusion about the identity of the airship shot down by William Lee Robinson. I think this was probably caused by the displaying of other fragments at Kofli. So this is uh, an expert from the Imperial War Museum who also thinks that, you know, this metal fragment didn't come from the SL-11, the first airship to be shot down. So I wanted final confirmation, engineering confirmation, okay, because so far it's kind of um, uh, not hearsay evidence, but evidence uh, from uh, just communications. Uh, I wanted some direct evidence. Now, of course, the airships were manufactured in Germany. And I have a very good friend. Uh, this is Wolfgang Black. Uh, we, we have been uh, working together and we meet uh, twice a year in Russia before the pandemic because we are both on an advisory board for a particular university in Russia. Uh, and we go to, you know, concerts and uh, ballets and so forth together when we have the opportunity. So we know each other very well, and we are both uh, steel metallurgists. So I asked him to investigate for me, and he did actually quite a lot of work. He searched uh, the German archives, and I'm only going to present some of the work that he presented, uh, but that he found for me. So this is a, a kind of a document going back to um, 1909, covering the period 1909 to 1925 by uh, Johann Scheuter. Okay. Uh, and this is the construction of uh, the airship, and you can see the hydrogen balloons inside the wooden framework because these were actually constructed in wood, as as we thought, and the gondolas themselves uh, were in uh, in steel. The gondolas are the bits hanging underneath the uh, airship. And there was also a dissertation from the University of Mainham, which he found from 1987 by Dorothea. Holland, and uh, she basically looked at the history of airships and their construction and so forth. And uh, 
the interesting thing is SL-11 was completed in August 1960 and it attended two raids on the 24th and the 31st of August, but both of them uh, failed, uh, you know, they ended prematurely. So the first, uh, if, you, if you like, the first successful raid was on the 2nd of September, 2000 kilograms of bombs dropped on London and it was shut down by uh, um, Leaf, Captain Leaf, uh, Lieutenant Leaf. So I'm now convinced, and also Michael Cook uh, accepts, that this piece of metal actually didn't come from the SL-11, but from one of the Zeppelins that was shot down near Kafli. Now, I want to finish off by actually showing what a modern duralumin alloy might look like. And for that, we need to have a magnification where we can see atoms. Not only can we see atoms, but we can actually find out what they are. So this is an instrument called a field ion microscope and atom probe, which was built in our department by Bob Wo, the late Bob Wo. And basically, you know, you put your metal sample in there and it pulls out the atoms by giving an electric pulse. And you can form an image to show how the atoms are distributed inside your metal. And you also measure the time that an atom takes to fly along this path. And from that, you can precisely work out what that atom is. So I'm going to show you images of duralumin. So these are each dot is an atom of aluminium here, and these are the atoms of copper. So really, we don't want very coarse particles of copper aluminium precipitates, but we want these very fine particles because the finer they are and the larger the number density, that means the number of particles per unit volume, the greater is the strength of your alloy. And just to show you another image that it took, uh, these are the aluminum atoms forming in plates. Uh, the reason why they form in plates of aluminum copper compounds uh, is another story. But I'll stop there and I'll be very happy to answer questions. And also, you know, if somebody can point out, uh, one of the students can comment on what they've been taught about how to do a historical investigation, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, sorry, we had uh, some trouble with the mute button there. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Patricia. That was fantastic. I mean, I've learned lots about science and I've also learned a lot about airships, so um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And fantastically, we've got some really good questions that have come in. Uh, we've got a few questions actually from pupils I teach in year seven. So. Um, I actually think I'm going to start off with this question by Tollick. Um, he very sensibly has asked, why would the Germans build an airship out of wood if wood sets alight so easily and can be destroyed so quickly? Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. So wood is actually a really good engineering material in the sense that it is very stiff and light at the same time. Uh, so, you know, if we could uh, actually make uh, buildings using wood, uh, then we would save a lot of CO2 uh, instead of using steel. Uh, but there is this risk of fire that you, you point out. Uh, however, the need to actually fly, in other words, uh, to have a, an overall density which is less than that of air, governs uh, the use of wood. And remember, duralumin was invented about the same time. So you're not absolutely certain about how it will work. And when they first made the framework using duralumin, I think the airship basically split into two and so on. So uh, the SL company decided to stick with wood, whereas Zeppelin went on to use uh, duralumin. So the idea was that, uh, you know, uh, obviously there is a risk of fire, but with many, many military things, uh, you have to balance the risk against uh, gaining an altitude which is high enough so that ground fire, you know, is uh, firing from the ground becomes very difficult uh, to hit the target. Okay. So that's essentially the reason the properties of wood. It's a wonderful material. It's extremely rigid and light. 
Thank you very much. I think Tolik will be very satisfied with that answer. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, the idea of using wood to build an airship seems strange to me too, but there we go. Um, a slightly different question here, but along the same theme as sort of the airship as like a military uh, machine. Which is, um, when did airships first begin being used in battle? Was that in the First World War? And were they ever used on the front line for bombing campaigns or were they more of a domestic thing? Uh, so, so it was uh, in the First World War that they were used in uh, anger. And the military uh, used the airships for surveillance as well as, uh, you know, for trying to uh, attack the enemy. But surveillance, you know, from the air to see where the sole enemy is and so forth uh, was uh, one of the reasons for using airships. And uh, I think in Britain, they also uh, made some airships. You know, you must remember that uh, before the First World War, uh, the royal families of Britain and Germany were, had a connection. Okay, So it was uh, quite easy for them to get uh, the Duralumin technology. To, I think it was Vickers in England uh, uh, to make uh, make an airship and so on, but uh, it wasn't um, used by the military in Britain. Was that your question or? Uh, yes, no, thank you. That's that's really interesting. I mean, just the idea of using an airship in, in battle just seems so strange, but that that uh, makes a lot of sense. I guess one more question on this sort of uh, military route before we get on to um, some of the some more technological points is Based on your research into this story, uh, do you think the use of airships helped or hindered the German campaign against the British during World War One? I? I mean, I can imagine that they really added to the image of the Germans as being like, like cruel Huns or baby killers. So do you think they actually served their purpose? Well, um, they didn't cause a great deal of death. OK, uh, you know, I, I gave you some figures uh, compared with, you know, the soldiers, uh, very large numbers of soldiers who died at the front line during World War One in the trenches and so on. The number of deaths was of the order of 500. But the psychological effect of an enemy that you can't do anything about was huge. Uh, you know, terrorizing, basically uh, the English language meaning of terrorizing. Uh, the population. So you could argue that initially they did achieve their, their purpose, that you've got these objects coming from the air and we can't do anything about them and they're dropping bombs. Can I just uh, go back to the first question? You see, the issue of the wood catching fire, uh, the hydrogen has to catch fire before the wood. Uh, so it's really there's nothing much you can do to prevent the hydrogen from getting catching fire once you use this incendiary and uh, blast bullets. Thank you. Uh, that that's really really interesting. Um, Tolik, the person who asked that question about the wood app, has actually come back with an, another question um, mm -hmm. on the sort of uh, logistics of this. And he said, "The airships are so big. How were they not noticed by surveillance? And if they went very high?" How could the crew of the airship actually see anything? Yeah, uh, so um, their height uh, was such that uh, if they attacked at night, you would have to direct searchlights at the object before you can actually target your shooting. So it was very difficult actually to spot them because uh, many of the raids were at night. Uh, they didn't do daylight raids. Um, so. In those days, of course, there was nothing such as radar and so forth. So you just had to be lucky enough to spot them. And in fact, uh, Leif, uh, when he took off uh, uh, trying to find these, uh, he couldn't see them for quite a long time during his flight. It was just by chance that he, uh, one of the spotlights had caught the airship and he noticed the glow of the spotlight and headed towards there. So they were very difficult to actually spot uh, if they did nitrates. Now, how did they see where they were attacking? You know, to be honest, I don't know. And it's a very good question. I don't want to speculate because, you know, from a height of something uh, over 16,000 feet, how do you actually see where your target is apart from a rough area? Well, thank you very much. Um, 
we're now moving sort of away from those historical questions, but thank you very much, Tolik. Those are superb. Um, on to uh, questions about sort of air travel today, really. So the first is from um, Marcus, who's asked, what kinds of materials are today's aeroplanes built from? Is it a form of duralium or a different alloy altogether? Yeah, so um, the civilian aircraft, OK, uh, which have uh, large wings, uh, they are made of duralumin, but uh, a modern version of it with very controlled heat treatment. But duralumin itself uh, corrodes very easily. So what you do is you bond pure aluminium to the duralumin because pure aluminium is much more corrosion resistant. So what you see on the wing is actually uh, a very thin layer of pure aluminium on top and under the duralumin. So the duralumin is strong, pure aluminium is not, but the pure aluminium protects uh, corrosion. If you, if you talk about uh, military aircraft, which are really quite small and they have other requirements uh, such as speed and uh, so on, uh, composite materials are used for a large part of the structure because uh, they can be stiff and uh, extremely light. You now have composite materials coming into civilian aircraft as well uh, for the body of the aircraft. Uh, so, you know, for example, the latest uh, Boeing and Airbus aircraft uh, will be using uh, use already composite materials for the body of the aircraft. Thank you very much. Um, and I think our next question uh, leads quite nicely on from that, which is um, just what I asked. So would airships, hydrogen or helium based, be a lower carbon alternative to commercial air travel. So could the airship make a return in the 2000s? Uh, indeed, uh, um, there is actually a company in Britain which is uh, in the stages of manufacturing uh, large airships for uh, passenger transport. The, the only problem actually is the control. You know, if you have uh, really bad weather and strong winds and so on, then if you have a very large object in the air, then it's hard to control. So I'm not sure whether airships themselves will compete very much uh, against other technologies which are being attempted. For example, uh, electrically uh, driven aircraft. You know, that, that is a very big area of uh, both research and uh, technology development. Uh, so Norway, for example, by 2025 has the target for all internal flights to be electrically driven engines rather than uh, the normal jet engine that you have. So that is a very big area of uh, development. Well, thank you very much. That certainly answered my question. And I think um, if you were a nervous flyer, being in an airship in a storm is probably not something you want to be uh, experiencing. Um, well, I, all that remains to say really is once again, thank you so much for uh, giving this talk, uh, Professor Padisha. It's been an absolute privilege to learn both about the sort of the history of this airship and also some of the science and to see how you sort of trace this story was, was a real, real privilege. Um, to anyone uh, who is still here, please do fill in our feedback form. Um, actually, sorry, Professor Padisha, we've just had one more question. Would it be okay to ask this? Yes. Um, no problem. It's Tolik once again, so um, let's hope he's, uh, let's hope he's uh, asked a reasonably fair question. So I noticed on the diagram of the elements in duralium uh, mm. that went along with copper, that, that along with copper and silver, there were a bunch of more trace elements like iron. Are yeah. those elements supposed to be there or did they accidentally come in during the manufacture? The iron uh, is, is an impurity. In other words, uh, you know, you don't really want it there. But the silver and magnesium are deliberate additions uh, to control the, in those days, to control the properties. But we now know more about how they interact to slow down the precipitation of copper so that you can control the whole um, event more carefully. Wow. Uh, well, thank you very much, Tolik. You've been incredibly observant there. Well done. Um, I suppose there is something worth asking. Um, for, let's say, a young student, maybe sort of 12, 13, 14, who is really interested in sort of metallurgy and this kind of area, are there any sort of good introductory books you could recommend or maybe places to visit in Cambridge 
Yeah, so, so Cambridge, of course, uh, does a lot of, uh, uh, you know, at, at uh, various times in the year, there are events for school, school children. OK, uh, now this year they have been all online, uh, but they are available still online. If you search the University of Cambridge's uh, website, but the book that I would recommend uh, is called Stuff Matters. OK, Stuff Matters, and it's by uh, Mark Miodovnik. I'll send you an email uh, after, after this event. Well, thank you very much. We'll make sure we end up with a copy of that in the school library, if for no one else but for Tolik. Um, so once again, uh, Professor Padisha, thank you so much for this talk. Um, a recording of this will be available on our website. And um, yeah, thank you very much. I hope thank you all very much. OK, it's always nice to have an audience when I'm talking. OK, <laughs> OK, goodbye. <laughs>